happy Friday to one and all. This is episode 47 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank everyone once again for joining me. And if you're checking out episode 47 on the YouTube channel and haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. Or if you're joining me for the audio version of the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or the other platforms and haven't done so already, and if you enjoy the content, don't forget, click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you will be instantly notified when another episode of this podcast drops. So today is Diane Keaton's 78th birthday. And for a certain generation, like my parents' generation, for many of them, it's hard to believe that someone, um, you know, that was young in their 20s and into the 30s, when they were at that age, it's kind of hard to wrap their head around the fact that she's that old, but she's 78. She still looks fantastic. And um, not judging, but if she's had any work done, I don't know. I mean, it's very, very subtle. She, to me, and this is going back to the the Something's Gotta Give era, incredibly a movie which is now 20 years old. There was a lot of chatter back then about how, uh, you know, Diane, as she was at the time, you know, in her kind of late 50s, had not gone under the knife, still looked like herself and not altered, just older. And there was just a lot of chatter about that. And it's real tough. It's a lot tougher for women in Hollywood than men. We all know that. But she's amazing. She is um, Oscar winner for Annie Hall, a movie that's now, you know, it's how many years old? About 46 plus years old, 1977, the year after Taxi Driver, Network, and Rocky. Um, but she won her Oscar for her kind of madcap screwball, but deeply human performance as the title character, Annie Hall. And she had been in The Godfather, you know, she was with Pacino in The Godfather and the whole thing, and has given many memorable performances uh, across her career. And in addition to the Oscar nomination uh, and win for Annie Hall, she was nominated for the Warren Beatty film Reds, and uh, she was up for uh, Something's Gotta Give, and just an amazing career. It seems like she should have had more than a total of four Oscar nominations, but the other one is a movie I actually saw in theaters. Uh, it's not that good. Uh, Marvin's Room. And there, it's strange because I remember there was chatter uh, in 96 and then in 97 at the Oscars, the, the first wives went to the Oscars, um, you know, her co-stars and, and the first wives club was kind of a, even with the strength of the cast, you had Diane and Goldie Hawn, and of course, Bette Midler. <laughs> Bette Midler always is like stealing scenes left and right. But there was actually chatter because Diane had the most challenging of the roles in that particular film that maybe because her performance was so strong, she would get nominated for First Wives Club. But it ended up she got nominated for Marvin's Room, which I believe was the last film that DiCaprio shot before Titanic. And it's not that good. It's a movie you want to like more than you do. And I remember there were some walkouts based on the stage play. Incredible cast. Mr. De Niro, Bobby D, plays Dr. Wally. It's weird that I remember the name of his character was Dr. Wally. Um, Hume Cronin, tremendous cast. Meryl Streep. Let me tell you something. Diane Keaton runs rings around Meryl Streep. And Meryl Streep might be the goat, but in that movie, she gave way. Meryl gave way, and she let Diane do the heavy lifting. So as far as that, the 97 Oscars were a great Oscars. Uh, very entertaining, because I had seen so many of the films nominated from The English Patient and Fargo on down. And I don't remember which award. I feel like it was one of the um, musical score awards. Not 100%. But Goldie and Diane and Bette were on stage together giving, you know, giving out an Oscar. They were presenters. <laughs> and Ben says something like, 
first wives go to the Oscars, and the place was going crazy. I don't think everyone was expecting the three of them to be up there presenting. And then there was a joke about uh, Diane being nominated, and but I believe both Goldie and Bette, but maybe it was just Goldie, they said something like, don't worry, darling, I voted for you. <laughs> and Diane looked so embarrassed, but it was hilarious. So what I want to talk about in particular is, like, she's, to me, a, a unicorn. She's a unicorn in the sense that she didn't immediately uh, start to do anything to try to retain her youthful beauty. She aged in a normal fashion, and you can track her performances, uh, you know, and Goldie Hawn, in First Wives Club, explains it. She lays it out, that there are three roles for successful big-time actresses in Hollywood. And Goldie's character in the film is a successful actress. And she says the only three roles are Babe, District Attorney, Driving Miss Daisy. So you're either the hot young thing or your school marm, district attorney. The district attorney might get a little action, but not a, you're not objectified in the same way. See, it, it's one of those things. You want to argue that with me as a, as a film scholar. We, we could go in a million different directions. But the point is, Cary Grant played Cary Grant roles for three decades. Cary Grant was doing Cary Grant stuff in the 30s. And then from the 40s until almost the middle 60s. He was doing the same kind of shtick because he was Cary Grant. In a suit, Grant was ageless. Doesn't work that way. You know, go back to the 1930s and 40s. Mary Astor in the Maltese Falcon is playing the sexy, mysterious femme fatale with Bogart. And then a couple of years later, she's playing the school marm with Judy Garland in Meet Me in St. Louis. And I remember watching Meet Me in St. Louis, and I, I heard of the film. I didn't know that that Mary Esther was in it. And I was just, I was cracking up because we had been talking about this thing. This was even before First Wives Club. And it's like, okay, so so Mary Esther goes from every guy wants her to, well, she's old. Overnight, Sally Field, 1988 punchline. She plays Tom Hanks's theoretical love interest. Six years later in Forrest Gump, she plays his what? She plays his mom. His mom. Speaking of, Cary Grant, North by Northwest, 1959, four years earlier, the actress Jessie Royce Landis in To Catch a Thief. Grace Kelly. Cary Grant plays a retired jewel thief who may not be so retired, but one thing we know for sure, he wants to compromise Grace Kelly's virtue. Asshole. But in To Catch a Thief, the actress Jessie Royce Landis plays Grace Kelly's mom. Now, they're both women of means. They're society ladies. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But Jesse Royce Landis is giving Cary Grant very non-kosher, non-matronly gazes. Because after all, he's Cary Grant. Fast forward four years. North by Northwest, the most entertaining film Alfred Hitchcock ever made. And when you talk about a movie star, an all-time guy, and I might make the argument, and I've made the argument elsewhere, Cary Grant is the greatest star Hollywood's ever known. It has nothing to do with Diane Keaton. But Cary Grant, in that movie, is extraordinary, but... Jesse Royce Landis, the same actress who was giving him the eyeball like she wanted to, you know, if my daughter's not going to go for you, maybe I can have a crack. She plays his mom in North by Northwest, even though Cary Grant is actually, they are four years apart in age. I believe Cary was actually older than her, but she plays his mom. So that's the kind of ageism that was being discussed in the First Wives Club, and just the general sense that once you reach a certain age, you're not going to do anything. But Diane Keaton did not, she did not fall for any of that shit. And if you look at her career, she had a normal progression. One of her kind of big performances in the 80s, which got acclaim, not Oscar level, but Baby Boom, where she plays a professional woman who 
I don't even, I didn't see the film. I'm not sure if she has a child or adopts a child, but she ends up a mom. And so she was playing age appropriate roles. Cary Grant in North by Northwest is not supposed to be as old, I don't believe, as he was in real life. Yeah, my joke the other day, how old Cary Grant, old Cary, fine, how you? But Cary was in his, um, I believe he was in his mid, mid 50s already with North by Northwest. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Eva Marie Saint is young enough to be his daughter. Audrey Hepburn in Charade, 1963. Fucking great movie, right? The best Hitchcock film that Hitchcock didn't make. Audrey looks young enough to be his granddaughter, and she is all over him. God bless Cary Grant. But Diane aged gracefully. And there's a beautiful moment in one of my favorite films with her for her performance and for what she brings to the table as a great actress who, much like Meryl Streep, gave her room in Marvin's room to run the show, to be the star. In Father of the Bride, Diane Keaton is mostly on the sidelines as Steve Martin goes through all of this kind of zany, the Steve Martin of that era. You know, man, Steve Martin made so many great movies in that stretch. From, you know, 1987 through 91, you remember Roxanne, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, My Blue Heaven, Father of the Bride, L.A. Story. I'll have a half decaffeinated, I'll have a half double decaffeinated half calf with a twist of lemon. I'll have a twist of lemon. I'll have a twist of lemon. Brilliant. Steve Martin and Father of the Bride is fantastic. Kimberly Williams as the daughter, she's great. They have good chemistry. And Diane doesn't get to do that much. But Steve Martin, even though it's his movie, he gives her one moment. He gives her one moment to shine. They're about to give away their daughter. And Diane is dressed up. And Steve, earnestly, no comedic stuff, he earnestly says, you shouldn't look this good. It's not fair to the bride. And the look on Diane's face is magnificent. She sells it. And Martin sells it. And you realize that even though she didn't really have much heavy lifting to do in that film, boy, was she well cast. Now, my favorite Diane Keaton film and performance. So with me, when it comes to comedies, I love comedies. Really, I love all genres. When I was at NYU, just because of the way things kind of worked out with my schedule and various semesters, and sometimes what courses are available that will fill up your requirements. It's sometimes as simple as that. If you happen to need an advanced seminar, when Martin Scorsese is teaching that advanced seminar, or Spike Lee, or Jim Jarmusch, or any of the you know kind of big NYU superstars, Chris Columbus, uh, you might get lucky and get to have a famous person for your professor. But because of the way the schedules broke down and the way um, different professors would teach different classes for different terms, even back then, um, I ended up focusing to a larger extent on horror films, musicals, and westerns. It doesn't mean that I didn't see any comedies or contemplate or write papers. It just means that the courses that were focused squarely on one genre, the horror film, the western, and well, this, I, I didn't take a course called the musical, but a couple of classes Man, I saw a lot of Fred Astaire films. <laughs> it's a good thing I like Fred Astaire because I sure as fuck saw a lot of movies with Fred Astaire. <laughs> Diane Keaton had a way about her, a madcap quality in her early work and in her later work that you can't really explain it, but it marks her as different than anyone else, in my opinion, that worked in the business. Because we saw the dramatic chops in films like um, The Godfather and in movies like early 80s, Shoot the Moon, and uh, Interiors, you know, another Woody Allen film. We saw that she had the dramatic ability, but she also had that kind of madcap aspect, the screwball comedy ethos. So I love comedies is what I'm saying. I love comedies. It's not a genre that I dismiss, and I don't subscribe to the idea. Yes, if you want me to say that 
uh, Hannah and Her Sisters, which is a Woody Allen film, not with Diane Keaton. But if you want to say that the laughs are somehow a little bit more intellectual in that than in Airplane, fine. But if you laugh, it's fine. I don't give a shit. However, you get the audience to laugh. So I love comedies. But in general, comedies don't hold up to repeated viewings for me in most cases. Home Alone being an exception, but a big part of that for me is that it is a Christmas movie. And when I'm in the holiday spirit, it's a movie I'll fire up more for that reason. And yes, I, I think it's a terrific story and, and the, the antics and the Daniel Stern and Joe Pesci and everything. Terrific. Catherine O'Hara. Conventional movie comedies. I usually don't watch multiple times. I've seen Tootsie, Tootsie a number of times, but that's also, that's a little bit different. It's an outlier. It's an acting masterclass from one of the all-time greats in Dustin Hoffman. Airplane, Naked Gun, those movies I've seen multiple times because the satire, they're so stupid that you can almost look forward to seeing the same shtick again and again. Same with Austin Powers, especially the first Austin Powers movie. This organization will not tolerate Failure. Scott! Great. But as far as straightforward movie comedies, the movie that I have seen the most is a film where Diane Keaton, once again, her co-star, lets her shine. Let's her be the star. And it's Woody Allen's 1993 film, which I believe is one of his best comedies, Manhattan Murder Mystery. And it came at a time... You know, Woody Allen throughout time has been a polarizing and controversial figure for a lot of different reasons. I'm not here to make judgments or anything like that. I'm just here to talk about Diane Keaton and what she's able to do and what she has done in these other roles, but specifically in this particular film, Manhattan Murder Mystery, which is in its own way, as many of Woody Allen films, Woody Allen's films are, love letters to New York City. And New York City at a certain time, and as somebody who spent so many hours of his life in that city, Hollywood films of the 90s hit different. To some extent, the 80s, but the 90s especially. And Manhattan Murder Mystery, just as it says, and a little bit of trivia, uh, before Woody Allen himself knew what the title of Annie Hall was going to be, uh, one of the working titles was Manhattan Murder Mystery uh, because there was a mystery element to Annie Hall. I mean, it seems crazy, but that was a film uh, almost like Terrence Malick, Thin Red Line, where he shoots, you know, enough footage for an eight hour movie and then starts editing. Woody Allen and Diane Keaton shot a ton of footage that ended up never getting used for Annie Hall. They, who knows? It could be in a vault somewhere, but unless it's been treated, those original negatives are long since gone the way of the dodo. They got to be completely degraded beyond, you know, beyond even watching them. But Manhattan Murder Mystery has Woody's in real life. He would have been, how old would he have been? He would have been in his mid fifties. And Diane, oh, she's younger. She's in her mid to late forties. And I think the characters are like, they were playing again, age appropriate. Woody's not playing younger. And Diane's not playing younger. I think we're supposed to believe they're roughly the same age, but they're married. They, they have money. Uh, Diane wants to open a restaurant. You can tell she's a little flighty as Diane has played so many of those kind of space cadet flighty, la 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 type characters, but she's very sharp and the giggles and the laughter, because she does a lot of laughing and giggling in Manhattan murder mystery, kind of camouflage the fact that she's a smart cookie. Don't let the giggling fool you. She's no stupid, you know, no shrinking violet, and she's no moron. She's very, very sharp. And Woody's character in that film is in book publishing, and we're led to believe he's not a multimillionaire, but they have money. And Zach Braff, in a, like a blink, if you'll, you'll blink and you'll miss it cameo, plays their son in the film. And other terrific actors like Angelica Houston and Jerry Adler and Ron Rifkin show up. And Alan Alda is absolutely hysterical. You know, when I think Alan Alda, I don't think funny, but man, it's hilarious in this movie. But Woody was and has been a filmmaker who, you know, a lot of actors, again, regardless of what you think of him, that they will say, 
much as Clint Eastwood gets similar notices, and Judy Davis worked for both of those guys, Woody lets his actors be their best. And it's not an accident that there have been so many Oscar nominations and wins in Woody Allen films. Like, that doesn't happen in a vacuum. It means that he sets up the kind of environment where they're allowed to shine. And Woody wrote that script. Probably, you know, he used some of the material from Annie Hall, which didn't end up getting used. But as much as Woody is in a ton of the movie, and there are stretches where he just won't shut up, it's Diane's film from first frame to last. She's the engine driving the story. Woody is almost like the unwilling accomplice. But the basic setup is you have this dull, aging couple, 50-ish, they're supposed to be, as I say, they have a son in college, and they hit a lot of the big locations in New York City. We get to see what the Metropolitan Opera House and Lincoln Center look like, you know, in 1993, Madison Square Garden, 21 Club, Downtown Athletic Club. They just hit, at Bryant Park was just being modernized and renovated. It really had looked like crap circa 1990, because I remember when I was working in the city as a kid, walking around there, I said, this is fucking dumb. But... The substance of the story, and this is not one of those slow burn where it takes a long time to get to the plot, but Manhattan, Manhattan Murder Mystery, Woody and Diane, we immediately establish they've been together for a long time, clearly have great affection for each other. It's not that their marriage has hit the skids, it's that there really isn't that much excitement left. And they meet their neighbors, you know, down the hall neighbors, and Jerry Adler plays the husband. He later was, um, he was on The Sopranos as I think the character was Esh, but he was very, very strong in Sopranos as one of Tony's guys. And um, they meet this couple, and it's a comic scene because Woody is frantically trying to get out of this because there's a Bob Hope movie on television I want to watch. You know, no streaming in 1993. There's a movie that he wants to watch, and they're stuck in their neighbor's apartment, and this guy is showing him his stamp collection, and Woody is fucking hilarious. But it turns out that this is not just random. All of the information that we're given in this comedic scene comes into play because a few days later, the, the wife passes. And Woody accepts this. Woody's character, Larry Lipton, accepts this. Well, she died. There, there's a doctor, you know, the... Um, the building super was there. There's no foul play. Diane immediately smells a rat. She says, no, 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 this woman worked out. Her health was good. I don't buy it. Something's going on. And then the story unfolds from her initial suspicion, something is not kosher to a real murder mystery. And obviously the story wouldn't be, the film wouldn't be called Manhattan Murder Mystery if there wasn't actually an angle where this takes place. So you have Diane Keaton, Again, this is 90s. This is Hollywood in the 90s. And you have a female-driven major Hollywood feature where it is Diane Keaton literally running the show. Everything that happens, she creates all of the action. She is not the reactive female, you know, that Roger Ebert used to joke about, uh, he would call it seeing eye man. So, it's so many times in movies, you notice guys see something first. And he has to point it out to the woman because she's too dumb to figure it out on her own. Says, oh, did you see that? Yeah. In this movie, they do the opposite. Diane sees it, and then she has to point out to her slow-witted, even though he's not slow-witted. But when it comes to this particular case, which he keeps saying there's no case, there's no murder. The woman had a heart attack. She had a coronary. It's coronary, folks. I saw her. I saw her. Yeah, you saw her on the bus, the dead person's bus. Yeah, no car fare. But... Kicking and screaming, Woody is dragged along on this ridiculous, crazy, but it makes sense. A terrific mystery that you really can't guess. This is not one of those where you say who the killer is. It's not that kind of story. But it's a really interesting plot. And you figure nothing horrible is going to happen to Woody and Diane. As, as I say, Larry Lipton and Carol Lipton, great names. And Angelica Houston shows up. So, like, the Alan Alda character, he's a friend of both of them. But he has had a decades-long crush, going back to when they were in their 20s, with Diane. And he likes Woody well enough. And Woody gets along with him, too. He's a, he's a playwright. But Alan Alda wants her for himself. 
And Woody has a kind of a pain in the ass client, a, a successful author who's difficult to deal with sometimes, played by Angelica Houston. And the movie teases the possibility that each of them might be interested in eh, maybe straying a little bit from their marital vows. And a movie gives you enough to make you think that it's possible without giving anything away. And it does it in a non-judgmental fashion because you never really know what Woody's character is thinking because he plays, you know, there's a famous scene of them playing poker and Woody does some shtick with the cards, which is really funny. Like he's not necessarily known as a great physical comedian, but some of the stuff he does in this movie, he's so natural at it. He probably could have been a silent comedian if he had to. But Diane shines. She shines throughout in every scene. She owns it. And Woody and Alan Alda, they let her run the show. Even Angelica Houston, there's a big scene with the four of them. And it's Diane who you remember. And it's interesting because the movie got pretty good reviews. Like if you were to go on Rotten Tomatoes, the score is very high. It didn't do that well at the box office. And neither did Woody's previous film, which was Husbands and Wives, which came out right when that crazy scandal, which again, I can't really get into here, but you can, you can Google it. Uh, when that crazy scandal between Woody and um, his now wife, which is insane, uh, and his ex-girlfriend, uh, Mia Farrow, they worked together a number of times. Uh, but that scandal at Husbands and Wives was a movie that many people had as the best film of 1992, the year of Unforgiven, the year of The Crying Game, the year of A Few Good Men, the year of Sin of a Woman. But Husbands and Wives got swallowed up by the scandal. And Woody was able to turn around and work once again with his co-conspirator from films like, as I say, Manhattan, Interiors, Annie Hall, Diane Keaton, the brilliant, amazing Diane Keaton. So it is a film that is laugh out loud funny and has a terrific story. And it's the kind of thing where, as I talked about in the Clint Eastwood, when I had discussed Clint Eastwood on a previous podcast, if people say stuff like, I'm interested in seeing a Woody Allen film, but nothing too heavy and nothing from before, let's say the 90s. This is the film that I would recommend. Or if somebody said, hey, I watched Diane Keaton in Mad Money. Movie's not that good, but can you recommend another film where you think that I would like it? Because she's, she's terrific. This is the movie that I, that I recommend. So it, it's like, in, in the estimation of people watching it now, it plays really well. Because the story is so solid. And the New York locations, such beauty. The movie opens with a helicopter shot as the Bobby Short, I Happen to Like New York, I Happen to Like New York, an incredible tune, is playing. And the helicopter shot is kind of a panorama of Manhattan as it looked, you know, circa early 1990s, early to mid 90s. And then it, it kind of ends on Madison Square Garden slash Penn Station. And then we see the two main characters at a New York Ranger game. And Woody famously has season tickets to a lot of the different, you know, New York sports teams. So Manhattan Murder Mystery is available on streaming. It's not free anywhere. And not that I'm looking at this all the time, but I don't recall it ever being free on Netflix or any of the streamers. Um, but it is available for rent and, you know, kind of a cheap purchase on Amazon Prime and Apple TV if you get that, you know, three bucks, four bucks, five bucks. But it is an exemplary movie comedy where the laughs never stop but the story really grabs you and it's you're surprised by how much it grabs you because you keep saying, none of this makes any sense. How could this, how could she have died and this guy, again, I'm not gonna give it away, but it's my favorite Diane Keaton film and performance and I highly recommend it. And hey, she's 78, she's still working. She's still a character. You know, she wrote, she's written a couple of books, God bless her. And as somebody who lived in Huntington as long as I did, she is the answer to a trivia question, a local trivia question. Who was the last guest to appear at the Huntington Book Review, the mom and pop bookstore that operated like a Barnes and Noble? Diane Keaton in February of 2020. And with that, we've reached the end of episode 47 of the Confessions of a Not So Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank one and all for joining me again and if you're checking out the YouTube version of the podcast and haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 48 real soon.